we'll get our uh, our things going. So, hello and welcome to the Chorus Forum on how we can ensure research integrity. We've actually had over 150 people register for today's event from all around the globe. Today's forum would not be possible without the generous sponsorship coming from ACM, IEEE, ACS, AIP Publishing, Geoscience World, Silverchair, and STM. Today's forum will run until 12.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and will also be rec recorded for later viewing. As our speakers present today, feel free to use Zoom's QA feature found at the bottom of the Zoom window to ask your questions. They'll either be answered by the speakers live or in the QA window. Also, feel free to upvote questions that you think are important so we are sure to get to them. Chorus is a community effort dedicated to making open research work. Our goals are to help our main stakeholders of publishers, institutions, and funders scale their OA compliance. We've worked to develop metrics about open data, improve the overall quality of their metadata related to open research, host forums and workshops just like today's forum to connect the stakeholders so they can learn and hopefully build trust with each other. Regarding research integrity, I am proud to say that Chorus is already testing, incorporating the retraction watch metadata from Crossref into our reporting. So we have a stellar list of speakers today. Now over to you, Daniel, to get the show on the road. Thank you, Howard, and uh, thank you to uh, Chorus for the invitation to serve as your moderator today. Um, so before we actually get into the forum, uh, I'd like to first introduce myself and give you a little background on COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics, its mission and how it supports integrity in scholarly publishing. Next slide, please. So. I've been in uh, scholarly publishing for nearly three decades. Uh, currently, I am the director of publications and executive editor for the American Urological Society or Association. Um, before that, I was with the uh, American Chemical Society for three and a half years and the American Physical Society for 24. So as you can see, I've spent my entire publishing career uh, with society publishers. Uh, and of course, in the context of today's forum on research integrity, uh, I should also note that I am the current chair of COPE. Next slide, please. So COPE was established in 1997. It started off as just a group of medical editors um, getting together to discuss issues of uh, ethics and, and other uh, integrity issues amongst their journals. Uh, and since then, it has grown substantially uh, into an organization with over 13,500 members from around the world. Next slide. COPE is organized and run through volunteer trustee board and council members. And as you can see, they well represent um, the international nature of scholarly publishing. Uh, we continue to look to increase our diversity um, since we are still a little more uh, European and US centric. But as you can see, we have uh, uh, physicians from around the world um, that we are able to bring the conversation uh, to all parts um, of, the, of the world. Next slide, please. So as I said, uh, we're made up, we have over 13,000 members, primarily the editors of scholarly journals um, and associated individuals and companies uh, which support the publication endeavor. I should note that very recently, we've opened up membership to universities and research institutions as well to sort of broaden the conversation uh, to better uh, get a handle on what we can do to improve the integrity of the published literature. Next slide, please. So our, our mission is to educate and advance the knowledge and the methods of safeguarding the integrity of the scholarly record. Our, our vision is to create a future in which ethical practice and scholarship is the cultural norm. We do this in a number of ways. We offer support to our members through guidelines and flowcharts. 
We provide leadership in the conversation, bringing together uh, all the particular stakeholders and parties so we can have a conversation on how to improve uh, integrity in research and its publications. We also uh, act as the voice offering neutral, professional uh, input on current debates. Next slide. We fulfill this mission in a number of ways. Um, for our members, we have forums, which allow uh, the members to get together and discuss particular cases and give each other advice, counting on the uh, knowledge of a broader group to, to reach a, uh, an ethical solution. Um, as I noted before, we also have a series of output that we deliver around, you know, to everyone um, of who has an interest in it through discussion documents where we talk about current trends and themes in um, publication ethics. Um, we have more formal policy guidelines, which really get into the details. And from that, we develop flow charts to help editors go through a step-by-step -step process um, to uh, reach solutions and to try to make it easier for them to manage. We also have um, uh, electronic means at which we interact. We hold webinars, um, which are open to everyone, uh, where we bring information and topics of interest. Uh, we also have seminars, which are generally for members only. Uh, they specifically talk about uh, new practices, new guidelines, and uh, again, current topics of interest. We also do a lot of collaborative work. Um, for instance, uh, we are a joint founder of the Principles of Transparency and Best Practice in Scholarly Publishing, which we've worked closely with DOAJ, OASPA, and WAMI. Next slide, please. That was a, just a quick run through of who COPE is, what we do, and how we uh, uh, currently support uh, ethical practices in scholarly publishing. And now I am absolutely thrilled to be able to introduce this wonderful panel. As Howard said, we have a full schedule, so I'd like to get to them as quickly as possible. Um, each speaker brings a very fresh perspective on scholarly research and how we can create an environment that supports ethical practices and improve the integrity of the published literature. Um, the, the four speakers we have today are Edward Dunn, who's the executive editor of Mathematical Reviews at the American Mathematical Society. Michael Levine Clark, who's the Dean and Director at the University of Denver Libraries. Next up would be Todd Carpenter, Executive Director of the National Information Standards Organization, or probably better known as NISO. And Louisa Flintoff, who's the Senior Publisher at Wiley. Now, just as a reminder, we're gonna let all the speakers give their brief pre presentations first, and then we'll go into a general Q&A at the end. Uh, as a reminder, please use the Q&A button at the bottom and be sure that if someone asks uh, a question of interest, you can upvote it, bringing it greater priority as we uh, go through the, uh, uh, the Q&A period. So now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Edward Dunn uh, from Mathematical Reviews. Edward, it's all yours. All right. Well, thank you, Daniel. And... Uh... I'm uh, sure you're happy to introduce me because I'm about to give props to COPE. Uh, in my job at Mathematical Reviews and Math Sign that I often uh, refer editors of journals who are having issues to the COPE guidelines. And in particular, those flow charts are great in particular for new editors. Um, next slide, please. So um, uh I think a lot of the people here, certainly the panelists, and I hope the participants are aware that uh, with digitization, computerization, moving uh, the research literature from paper to online, it's allowed a lot of things to happen. There is a lot more being published. There's a lot more research being done uh, because we've removed friction in the system. 
but sometimes with uh, less friction, you need more breaks to be able to control the system. Uh, from my standpoint, as the editor of Mathematical Reviews, where we provide uh, a, a service for the mathematics literature, there are two areas I see for a uh, need for integrity in the literature. One is the correctness of the bibliographic record. And the other one is establishing and maintaining standards for the research, which I'll sometimes refer to as um, editorial uh, integrity. Uh, slide, please. So as a mathematician, I often feel lucky um, to, to be in the environment I am in that uh, the mathematics research world is fortunate to have this uh, thing that we call mathematical reviews uh, when it started in 1940 by the American Math Society and transformed into Math Sina. And it not just indexes the literature, but we have a reviewing service. Um, so we have 25,000 active researchers who help us uh, understand the literature by writing post-publication third-party reviews, give us a lot of feedback on what's going on there. That helps a lot with editorial integrity. The bibliographic integrity, we rely a lot on our staff of 70 plus people. That includes catalogers, librarians, copy editors, uh, programmers. And on staff, we have 17 PhD math physicians. Slide, please. So here's what we're faced with when we look at the literature and this loss of friction uh, in publishing. Um, we started gathering data in 1940, initially on pieces of paper and index cards, now as a database. And if you're mathy, then you would try and uh, do a regression on this. And if you do, it's growing exponentially at about 3.5% per year. Um, the greater literature is probably growing even faster. Slide, please. So with this growth, you need tools to be able to keep track of it, right? Uh, the average human can't deal with 3.5% growth all the time. Um, and so there are various tools out there. I will focus on the one that I'm affiliated with. And you need it to be able to find stuff. Then you also need it, you know, I would hope, to be able to access the stuff that you found. Oh, this looks relevant. How do I get there? And then the third thing, which is more and more important, is you want to be able to have some assessment about the, sur the source you found. Is it, you know, first quality? Is it junk or something else? Slide, please. Um, so, you know, librarians and archivists will tell you, you know, just holding on to the material is just the beginning. The hard part is keeping track of it. Uh, we know this firsthand because we're going through the archives that we have, uh, well, let's say boxes of stuff, and trying to get them ready for entry into the AMS uh, archives. Um, and that's a big deal. And, um, uh, and so you need to have uh, a good cataloging system, good catalogers, and some tools. And a big important tool is metadata. Slide, please. So pretty much every literature database, whether it's ours or Google Scholar or uh, Web of Science, relies on metadata. Uh, mostly the metadata are created by publishers. Um, publishers love pushing this out. It gives them some control. Contains, or if, you, if you go to the NISA website, they'll tell you different things about metadata. Sorry about the background noise there. Um, uh, there are various types. Uh, a key type, though, for us is descriptive information. Then with metadata, sometimes secondary service, such as databases or libraries, will add to that uh, to make it suitable for their purposes. And so they will either complete it or correct it or enhance it. Slide, please. And, you know, uh, in my role here of making my uh, fellow panelists uh, uh, feel glad to have me here. Talk about JATS, which is affiliated with NISO and Todd Carpenter. Probably the most widely used set of metadata for publishing in the world. Uh, JATS is the journal article tag suite. Um, and it tells you how to format, how to present the, the data 
uh, that you're receiving uh, from publishers or preparing yourself. Um, and it's rather complete. It has about 350 elements and about 190 attributes that you want to um, keep track of. Slide, please. Uh, other sorts of data or metadata, document identifiers, DOI is the biggie there, author identifiers, ORC IDs. We also have ours, MR author IDs. We started those in 1940, so we've got a head start on others. Uh, institution identifiers, Ringgold IDs, ROR, uh, ORC IDs again, MR institution IDs. Again, we started those in 1940, um, unfair head start. And then in mathematics, there's a thing called the MSC, the Mathematics Subject Classification Scheme, um, which is a rather rich, you could call it an ontology, uh, for all sorts of mathematics subjects. Slide, please. So we have lots of standards, but what good is a standard if people don't use it or if they don't use it well? You know, without much thought, you can figure out two types of problems. One is incomplete records and two is errors. A lot of times publishers are groups of mathematicians publishing a journal through uh, you know, a university or a department, and they do just enough to trigger things such as getting a DOI. Um, you put an author's name in uh, and you got one, but maybe there were three authors on that paper. Uh, you put in the first page number, not all the page numbers, or you just always put in page number one. Um, the incentives for good producing good metadata are not always adequate. And sometimes it requires a third party to sort of help help out. Slide, please. So here's a, some lists of things that can go wrong in, in metadata. Uh, and this is based on things that we find on a regular basis. Uh, the given name and surname are combined in one uh, field. Uh, subject classifications, which are numerical, are mixed in with keywords. Um, so automated uh, parsing gets broken. Uh, a problem we have with view publishers is that the ISSNs for their journals are sent separately from the other metadata for the articles in the journal. Slide, please. Um, we also see that you know pre-publication, uh, you know, uh, online or you know, early online uh, publication is a big deal, and so sometimes the metadata refers to the pre-publication version of a paper instead of the published version. Uh, we have one journal that almost always has the ISSN for a different journal from the same publisher. Sometimes the PDF uh, uh, points to the wrong file or version. And what's a lot of fun is sometimes the DOI is already in use. We don't see that a lot, but it occurs. It's wrong or they never registered it. Slide, please. Um, <clears throat> So most of the metadata arrives, right? Publishers are keen for people to have their metadata. Um, and so if it's delivered to us, we can often complete it by waiting a little bit and going back to the publisher's website uh, when things would have been corrected by the publisher or completed by them. Oftentimes we can go to a DRI, DOI registry such as Crossref and find these things. Fortunately, people who are consistently making mistakes, we have a nice solution. We just write a little script to fix it all the time, such as the journal that always has the wrong SFM. Um, but in many cases, we just have to look at the paper itself and fill in the metadata. Slide, please. So I asked our cataloging and librarian department for some data about the corrections that they'd made in roughly a six month period. The start and stop dates are based on how we gather data here. So we processed about 62,000 journal articles in that period, and we made about 81,000 corrections and additions to the bibliographic metadata. This does not include our regular work on identifying authors, right? taking author name and attaching our author ID to it, or adding the subject classes, which is done at an editorial stage. Um, this is a fairly significant amount of correcting. Um, you know, it's more than one correction per paper, but realistically, many papers come through hunky dory, and it's the bad ones that take up most of your time. Slide, please. So, in the correcting and completing, we try and complete it 
so that uh, we can assign MR author IDs to uh, the authors. But sometimes it gets tricky. And so I gathered some of the fun ones. So Wei Wang, if you search in our database, will get you about 580 matches. 250 of them are exactly Wei Wang. Others are variations with the middle name or, or something in there. Um, if you look for uh, papers by Alexei Miasnikov, well, there are two of them with the exact same name. And for a long time, both of them were at Stevens Institute of Technology in New Jersey, and they were working in the same area. And they even had six papers together. So good luck separating one Alexei from the other. Slide, please. One of our longstanding favorites are the Plastinos. There are two of them. Both of them go by the name Angel or Ain Angel. One of them started using uh, Angelo or Angelo. Um, they work on the same area. They're in the same department of the same university, and they've jointly published 85 papers. We have a little note in our database saying, if you can't figure out which one is which, uh, write to uh, Plastino 1 because he answers email and Plastino 2 does not. So uh, it can be fun. But sometimes it goes the other way. Instead of having multiple people with the same name, you have one person with multiple names. Um, sort of randomly checking and talking to our catalogers, the sort of unofficial record is uh, a Ukrainian mathematician. There's one of him, but he has 41 different name variations on his publications. Slide, please. Now, most of this can be done programmatically, right? We can match with almost 100% certainty, about two thirds of the names come through. And the remaining, just a slight variation of information, you know, tells us that it's pretty blatant who it is when we keep moving on. But for the rest, it takes a human touch, right? In the case of Plastinos, we know that, that we should email someone. Slide, please. Editorial integrity. And I think this is an, something that is more actively talked about today than in the past. So, um, Using ISSNs, you can build a profile of a journal, and you can sort of look for deviations from that. Um, I made up a journal here, the Journal of the Society of Commutative Algebra, so it's all algebra. But what if half the papers are in it are computational fluid dynamics? This is based on a real example, but I've changed the names to protect the innocent and, and others. You can also look to see what journals are citing this journal and what journals are being cited from this journal, which gives you some data to start looking for citation stacking or citation cartels. Slide, please. Now for us, we have about 1,650 journals in mathematics and related areas that we cover. Um, and some of them have stopped publishing, but uh, we've, dropped our coverage of some number of them for editorial reasons over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, slide, please. To be included in MR coverage, we make public uh, that the, it ha the journal and the articles have to meet some criteria. And um, basically it has to be research, it has to be mathematics. Uh, we want you know some assurance that it's been refereed. Uh, that's in the editorial, that first link up there. The second one is we want it to basically follow publishing standards. And there we rely heavily on uh, COPE. Um, when journals are proposed for coverage, there's an editorial process they go through. And over the past six years and about three months, uh, just a little bit under 17% of the journals proposed for coverage have been accepted for coverage. Slide, please. So back to growth of literature, we have some, quote, special contributors to the growth of literature. Here's a journal that um, from 2019 to 2023 increased its size by more than an order of magnitude, 118 articles per year to 1,600. Slide, please. Even better journal from 2007 to 2021. Um, it went from sort of double digit articles per year, you know, 20 to 50, um, uh, up to about 100 per year. And in recent times, it's publishing 1,700 articles per year. Slide, please. 
In the news was this information that some citation cartels uh, were being found in mathematics. Um, and, um, uh, you know, this, this was a worry. So mathematicians were no longer allowed to be highly cited researchers in the web of science clarivate world. Um, so people asked whether or not this was a problem for, um, for us at Math Reviews and Math Science. Slide, please. Well, we'd already sort of figured this out before. These are two articles that uh, we had published in the AMS notices in 2019 and 2021. And we talked about how people with high citation counts are not necessarily the most uh, significant mathematicians, that there's not a good correlation between winning awards and high citation numbers. Slide, please. One way we can avoid this is that we don't just take reference lists from every journal, right? There's an editorial process in order to be indexed by MathSciNet. There's a second level in order to have your reference list uh, um, included in the database. And so there are only about a third of the journals. So looking at the article by Domingo de Campo mentioned in that science article, um, most of the journals being used by the cartels are not contributing to citation counts in MathSciNet. Slide, please. So conclusion, uh, digital age has allowed, you know, the removal of a lot of friction. In order to keep track of, you know, this new world, which allows a much greater diversity, much greater speed of doing things, uh, mathematics uses a mixture of tech and human tools to ensure bibliographic and editorial integrity of the uh, endeavor of mathematical research. Slide. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, next slide. Yep. So our next speaker is Michael Levine Clark. Michael, all yours. Great. Thanks, Dan, and thanks, thanks, um, Ed, for for that. Um, uh, great presentation that I, I I think flows really nicely into mine. Um, so so I'm I'm here to talk um, from an institutional perspective, and I thought a lot about what that meant um, as I was preparing this this talk. Um, so I thought about talking about the education that we need to do for our students and our our researchers about um, the the issues of that they need to think about in terms of of research integrity integrity, right? The um, uh, both um, sort of intentional and and unintentional um, uh, integrity issues around around publications and sort of what they need to think about as consumers and creators of of content. I chose instead to focus a little bit more narrowly on um, the publications of our institution um, and what we need to do um, as we as we manage access to and information about those publications. Next. Um, so uh, just a tiny bit about the University of Denver. And um, and and this is this is relevant because because we happen to be a sort of a unique um, type of institution. So we're, we're an R1 institution. Uh, for those not familiar with Carnegie classifications, means a doctoral university, very high research activity. There are 146 R1 institutions in in the U.S., um, but we're 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 a very small R one with only fifty three million dollars in annual research expenditure, and um, as a proxy of how much we're publishing, in twenty twenty three we published eight hundred and four articles that were indexed, or we had eight hundred and four articles indexed in Web of Science, right? So we're we're pretty small, and that means that that we're able to do, I think, a little bit more detailed analysis of the publications of, of our institution. We're able to have a better handle on, on sort of what's going on, and we're able to sometimes dig in and do a little bit more um, detailed work um, to understand um, some of our publication patterns. Next. Um, I'm I'm a librarian, but I'm 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 trying to give a, an institutional perspective. And I and I in, in putting this presentation together, I talked to some people in the library. Um, I talked, so I talked to um, specifically um, and in depth the um, our manager of of our institutional repository. I talked to uh, the vice provost for research, um, and 
I didn't talk to any researchers, but they talked about the researchers that they've talked to about research integrity issues. And, I'm, and I want to try to to sort of bring forward some of the things that that they discussed uh, uh, with me about the broad topic of research integrity. Next. Uh, one of the things that that came up um, in in both of my conversations was the idea of of the reputation of the researcher and the reputation of the institution. We do a lot of work around research information management in the library in 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 coordination with the Office of Research and the Office of Institutional Research. Uh, we manage. Um, uh, we or we don't manage, but we we have a project to um, clean up the metadata of faculty publications in in Watermark Faculty Success, which is a tool where our our faculty are required uh, to to enter all of their publications every year. Um, they do this with more or less accuracy and um, more or less completeness, and they don't always go back in to update things. So we. We have um, two FTE in the library that that do this work that that clean up the metadata around faculty publications, and obviously that's that's a lot of work. Um, they're constantly um, finding errors, um, article titles uh, that have changed, um, articles that never actually get published, um, articles that get published in a different year in which they were first entered, and so on. Um, that work is important. Uh, because it feeds into the faculty profiles uh, that that are uh, sort of the presentation of of the research to the world, and have um, a really important role to play in the reputation of our faculty and the reputation of the institution. Therefore, uh, so uh, that work feeds a lot of our of of our. Um, of access to information, including um, metadata in, in our institutional repository. Uh, in, the institutional repository, of course, has access, ha provides access to um, open versions of, of articles and um, open data sets. But all of this together is, is really important to the institution because we need to, we need to be providing um, the most accurate information as, as possible. Uh, next. I had an interesting conversation with our um, uh, 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 institutional repository manager about versioning, about um, the multiple versions of articles and how challenging that is for her and how concerning it is for some of our faculty, um, just as a general issue. Um, so she tries uh, in this research information management project to enter metadata about the version of record. Uh, that's obviously the preference of our faculty. Um, it's what we're trying to do when we're we're creating these faculty profiles, and and certainly what they want to be um, what they want to be representing in in their profiles um, to the world. Uh, but of course, in the institutional repository, there are there's a choice of multiple other versions often that we can link to as the open version, uh, right? It's very rare. It's relatively rare that the version of record is the version that we're linking to in the institutional repository. So there's a challenge here in in just sort of the accuracy of of linking metadata to content, but there's also um, a concern expressed by some of our faculty about the dangers of of having multiple versions that might have subtle differences and might have some in inaccuracies in in any of the earlier versions and and what that might do over time to the scholarly record, uh, which raises the question for for me is uh, what is, what is the, our responsibility uh, as an institution in managing access to those multiple versions to maintain research integrity over time. Um, next slide. Uh, I, I asked um, her in the, in the conversation with the institutional repository manager, I asked her about um, what amount of takedowns she's ever had to do in, in the IR. And it's surprisingly little. Um, she's taken down multiple um, or, or removed access to multiple dissertations and and that's a different issue and it's it's about um 
usually about proprietary information. Um, but in terms of published um, papers, it's it's only happened twice. Um, one was a, a, a an article that was accidentally published twice. Uh, the author wanted it removed from the second version removed from the institutional repository. And the, the second was um, the result of a serious um, episode of research misconduct where the senior, where the vice provost for research got involved and asked for it to be removed. But that seems like a relatively small amount. Um, and it, it either means that we're doing something really well, um, or it means that we're probably missing some things that maybe, um, maybe should have been removed for other reasons that we're just unaware of. Um, so uh, how can we be better at um, understanding the the both accidental and intentional uh, research mis misconduct that that might be existing in in our institutional repository. Next, when I talked to the vice Prov provost for research, she she indicated that that it's it's a relatively small problem, right? We are she investigates fewer than ten allegations of research misconduct annually. She said last year it was seven. Um, and most of these don't require any further action on her part, right? That there, there's an allegation, it's it's determined that it's not actually an issue that that warrants any further further action on her part. Occasionally, as in the case of that article that she wanted removed from the um, institutional repository, there's there's further action re required, but it's generally a really small issue, um, at least in her mind. Um, again, is it actually a small an issue as as it appears to be, or is, is there more that we're just missing? Next. Both the institutional repository manager and the vice provost for research talked to me about their concern about data sets and specifically the concern that um, there might be the ability to alter some of these data sets that we host and and you know how impossible that would be for us to to really understand um, the vpr actually requires researchers who are doing long, longitudinal studies to keep a, a second copy of the data sets that they've deposited on a on a local hard drive um, just for for protection um, next I thought that I was going to go into Retraction Watch and 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 search for University of Denver, and I was going to find a bunch of things, and I was going to then trace those articles through, and sort of talk about um, what we may or may what we may or may not have done in our research information management work and in our institutional repository to um, to respond to any particular re retraction. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised to see that there was only one University of Denver um, article listed in, in Retraction Watch. Next. Um, and in fact, it was it was there as a duplicate publication, um, and, and it was an error on the part of the journal publisher, the journal or the publisher. Next. And even and in fact, beyond that, it wasn't a publication of the University of Denver at all. It was a, a group of abstracts about a about a conference, and one of those abstracts was reporting on a paper um, that had been delivered by somebody from my university. Um, so uh, there, we don't have anything really, in, as far as I'm concerned, listed in um, Retraction Watch. And does that mean that that um, we're we're not um, actually doing anything worthy of retraction. Are those retractions not being noticed? Um, is there more that we could be doing? And it would be wonderful if some standards organization was working on on something around um, how to manage retractions across the information ecosystem. Next. So um, I guess I'd, I'd like to sort of think about about this as a broader question, what are, what are we missing? And what as an institution could we do more proactively to help I, um, make sure that the publications of, of, of our authors are, are um, accurately presented and that whenever there is an issue of um, that requires some sort of um, 
notification of, of a retraction or that requires that paper to be altered in some way. Um, how can we know about that and make sure that in the, the institutionally managed um, access to that information, we are we are presenting it accurately? Um, and now I will um, turn it over to Todd. All right, thanks, Michael. Um, I was quietly laughing when you made the cop, the quip about whether or not there was a standards organization doing anything in this space. Thank you. So hi, everyone. I'm Todd Carpenter. I'm the executive director of NISO. I'm going to be talking about a new NISO project, which was recently published uh, on the communication of uh, retractions and expressions of concerns within the scholarly publishing community. Uh, for those of you not familiar, NISO is a standard setting body for the publishing library and software communities. Uh, we have roughly a thousand members spread across publishers, libraries, and software providers. And we exist to create technical standards to help the community and, and best practices help the community navigate some of these issues. Next slide, please. So, Retractions have been a significant issue in the recent months and in the last couple of years of uh, in the scholarly community. Uh, not many issues uh, in our space raised to the level of being highlighted in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, or uh, the New York Times. Retractions and the, uh, the issues around them have been significant and have been featured in the mass media, uh, but it has been also an area of topic and concern in our community as well. Uh, a number of organizations over the last several years have had to issue mass retractions and, and hundreds or even thousands of papers have been withdrawn uh, as expressions of concern about scholarly research integrity have come up. Uh, this has impacted everything from uh, reputations as well as the, the business side of some companies in this space. Next slide, please. This is not a new issue. People are aware of retractions uh, and the issues around retractions. And uh, there was a project led by Jody Schneider, who's a professor at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, uh, again funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, on a project called Reducing the Inadvertent Spread of Retracted Science, uh, the RISERS Project. Next slide, please. Jody looked into and studied the ecosystem, the scholarly ecosystem around retractions. Uh, they looked at data gathered by Retraction Watch, but also did their own research about the ecosystem. Kind of trending along the lines of what Michael was talking about, retractions are not a common thing. They, it's roughly about one in one tenth of one percent. So if Michael's institution is publishing maybe a thousand papers, uh, to have one is roughly about average. Uh, it occurs in all fields, but most, uh, the majority exist in the areas around engineering. And they often, they come from a variety of perspectives, you, unethical research, redundant publications, as Michael noted, issues with data or the results. Um, so there are many reasons why retractions exist, but it's important to reflect that retraction is a healthy part of a communications ecosystem. Honest there are many reasons honest error could lead to retractions. It's part of doing robust science. If you look back at what you've done and say, oh, well, I made a mistake, that paper should be retracted. It could take days, months, years, even decades to recognize the errors in the ecosystem. And the challenge in our ecosystem is though, these retractions exist in our ecosystem, the process and the progress, the uh, practice uh, by the publishing community about how they signal to the community that a retraction has happened uh, is leading to, and the confusion and the inconsistent practice there is leading to many researchers to cite and use retracted work. Next slide, please. 
So as part of the Risers project, Jody put forward a number of recommendations to the community, both from the publisher perspective, the researcher perspective, the other stakeholders. And she also pointed out to standards organizations like COPE, like NISO, that drive community consensus, things that we should do uh, with regard to helping to improve the situation when it comes to retractions. Key amongst those was to develop some standards around retractions, labeling, uh, best practices about availability, uh, uh, taxonomies for an understanding what retractions are in our community and getting consistent use across all of the stakeholders in our space. Next slide, please. So Jody presented the results of her findings at the NISO Plus conference uh, that was held virtually in 2021. Now the NISO Plus conference is a forum where we try to discuss ideas. And in discussing those ideas, thinking about what sort of problems exist in the community, and then taking those ideas, the issues, the problems the community faces, and trying to turn those into practical outcomes that can lead to consensus development efforts, which lead to solutions and Im hopefully implementations and, and advancing the state of the art in the community. And as part of that process, Jody's ideas about a improved signaling to the community about retractions was selected as one of the output ideas that was advanced after the conference. A meeting was held in the, the following May to develop the project idea. And that idea was then approved in the fall of 2021. We then moved forward with approaching to the Sloan Foundation to see if they would continue to support the work and they graciously did. Many thanks again to Sloan. So uh, next slide. We appointed a working group uh, in the spring of 2022. Uh, it took a little while to get the working group organized, get the approvals going uh, after the proposal was received. We had a roughly 35 people involved in this project, ranging from various publishers and researchers, uh, publishing support organizations, uh, as well as libraries and other service providers. Next slide, please. The project we appointed the working group in 2022 uh, was moved forward as we started the research project, information gathering, uh, initial drafting. We launched a public comment period in the fall of 23. And I'm happy to announce uh, we published the final recommendation in June. Next slide. So the communication of retractions, removals, and expressions of concern, CREC, uh, we is the most recent recommended practice published by NISO. It was published on June 27th. It is freely available to the community. And I'll spend the next couple minutes talking very briefly about some of the recommendations in that, uh, in that publication. Next slide. So as was mentioned, Earlier, NISO is focusing here on metadata and display and the publication process. It is not focused on justification for retractions or expressions of concerns or removals. Uh, those were out of scope for this project. What we were looking at is what happens in the process after the editorial decision about a retraction. What should happen next? Uh, we was primarily focused on the version of record, but also considering other scholarly outputs. Um, many of the ideas and recommendations here relate to other, uh, re other research outputs. Um, so conference proceedings, et cetera, uh, could apply these recommendations. Although again, it was focused primarily on articles. And then it was focused primarily on implementation and oper operationalization of the recommendations in terms of practical solutions to helping the users understand that this paper has been retracted or withdrawn, or there is an expression of concern about this uh, research object. Next slide. So a summary of the recommendations, it outlines best practices for related metadata, uh, retraction-related metadata, 
the distribution of that metadata, what people should do when they get it, uh, how it should be displayed and how it should, who to whom it should be transferred. Uh, there is a responsibility assignment or a racy matrix uh, assigning, you know, here are the group of people who are part of, parties to this process and what should they be doing. And we explicitly decided not to develop a new metadata schema. What we wanted to do was define essential, essential if available, and recommended metadata elements. And I'll touch on those next. Next slide. So there are two elements to this process. The first is the retracted publication itself. And then there is a notice of retraction, which should be separately published. Uh, and the two items should be connected. And we provided some metadata elements associated to each. There are 23 elements defined for retracted publications, eight of which were considered essential. 14 were essential if available. And I'll get into that slightly. Um, not every publisher, for example, is using a DOI. Um, we didn't want to restrain the use of these uh, recommendations to only those publishers that are using the DOIs and DOI system. So it's uh, you should use the DOI and its associated metadata if you're using the DOI. But if you're not, there are other essential elements that everyone is using with regard to title. And there was one additional recommended element. As it regards the retraction notices, there were 20 elements. Again, eight essential, two essential if available, and 10 that were recommended. Next slide. So to go in a little bit more detail, some of the um, essential metadata elements had to do with, so work title, publication, publisher, the source, uh, the first author's uh, full name, corresponding author, uh, a, some sort of link between the retraction notice and the original publication, as well as the article type. This would be available and essential for every publication, regardless of, uh, regardless of the article type. Importantly, one of the recommendations is that a publisher or should prepend retract it in the title of the publication so that it is obvious to the entire ecosystem that if you see a title and it starts with retracted, you should know what that means. And since every uh, content object has a title of some sort, prepending retracted to it should be an immediate sign of concern for the for the end user of that publication. Next slide. As I mentioned, we did not uh, set out to develop a new metadata structure. What we wanted to do is build on existing metadata structures. And I, I really appreciate Ed having mentioned JATS at the beginning here. Uh, we rely heavily on the JATS system and included metadata elements where the retracted information should be provided in the tables that are existent in the standard. So we provide not only guidance about the description, uh, the metadata element, whether or not it's essential or essential if available, we then say, this is where the uh, metadata should reside in the JATS record. Next. We also provide implementation guidance for the various suppliers in this space, not only the publishers and the journal provide the journal publishers, but also for the web vendors and the, the organizations providing full text for aggregators, for library service platforms. We also explored some compli more complicated scenarios. So situations where there is a publication ahead of print or where journals have ceased publication and the, uh, the journal articles might be available through a, a repository or a, um, a dark archive and then been lit up after, public, after the journal has ceased. Uh, there is also guidance around uh, issues around where journals have been transferred 
and a new publisher exists for those, uh, those recommendations. There are a number of even more complex scenarios which the group didn't get into, say uh, kind of the living peer review process where uh, documents or articles are, are continually updated in the process. Didn't get into that level of detail, but give you some sense of, of where the work that was done. Next slide. The guidance also provides some uh, examples of how things should be uh, displayed, where you have sort of in, I know this is kind of small and hard to read there, but in red in the top figure one, it says retracted publication, or in the second, uh, the retracted article is prepended to the, uh, to the publication. Next slide. There are also workflows, uh, proposed flows and representations of how the process should work. Um, who's involved in this process, be they the author, uh, editorial office, the web vendor, the publisher, the aggregator, et cetera. Next slide. So the publication was released in June. Uh, it's freely available, as I mentioned. Uh, what we're doing now is focusing on promotion, maintenance, uh, and exploring areas of potential new work. Uh, we didn't get into, uh, didn't have time to develop that taxonomy of retractions. Maybe that's a, a group, that's a project for the uh, standing committee that is being uh, put together uh, uh, now that the publication is released. We are also looking to explore how these information, how this information should be integrated in the ecosystem, uh, much like Michael had discussed. How do the publisher system that has the retraction connect with the uh, repository community? Uh, what are way that what are ways that we can connect these various outputs, the versions that are available in this space? Um, it's also another element. We're also in the process of revising the journal article versions terminology. So how do those elements connect each other? Um, you know, Chorus, I think, is a, is a great example of how uh, data from various sources could be aggregated. Next slide. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, happy to hear them. For more information about the correct project, there is the link. Uh, and thank you, and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Todd. Appreciate that presentation. And now we're moving on to Louisa. It's all yours. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Louisa Flintoft. I'm a senior publishing director at Wiley. And my talk today is going to focus on a big picture view of developments in integrity challenges from a publisher perspective, and in particular, how the changes that we're seeing require publishers to be even more proactive in our approach to publishing integrity and also require us to collaborate not only with other publishers, but with essentially all stakeholders in the research ecosystem. Next slide, please. So um, problems with publishing integrity have been making headlines in the past few years, as, uh, as Todd already mentioned. And I realise that a flaw with this slide is that it suggests that these headlines are limited to the scientific media and to news channels that are dedicated to scholarly publishing like Retraction Watch. But as Todd mentioned in the previous presentation, the unprecedented increase in the issues that we're seeing has made the wider media as well. So the Wall Street Journal in the US, the Guardian and Times newspapers in the UK, El País in Spain, Le Monde in France, and so on. So, so why is there so much attention on this now? Um, I've been working in scientific publishing for more than 20 years, and I spent much of that time very much hands-on with journals and manuscripts in editorial roles and talking to other editors in my network. When I first started, and maybe for, say, the first decade of my career, it was a real shock if a journal had to retract a single paper or issue an expression of concern. Um, fast forward to now, for the last 18 months, my role at Wiley has focused on the journals that came to Wiley with the acquisition of Hindawi. 
As many of you will be aware, there's been a big spotlight on Hindawi as some of the journals had really extreme problems with paper mills, resulting in the retraction of thousands of papers. But Hindawi is far from the only publisher that's being affected. Um, and the reason for this is a much more concerted and you could even say industrial um, approach to attacks on publishing processes by, as we call them, bad actors, who are essentially finding any possible way to get into the publishing, publishing process and infrastructure. So, for example, we know that there are paper mill companies who provide authors with fabricated papers and they will also bribe editors or use fake editors. Um, to get papers accepted. Increasingly, we're seeing manipulation of citations as well. So Ed has discussed this um, in, in his presentation in this forum. And this is not only the small scale manipulations that might occur, for example, when a reviewer asks an author to cite their paper, but we're now seeing rings of researchers who collaborate to cite each other's work and even predatory journals that sneak additional citations into the metadata that they're providing to indexes. And, and this has a circular effect. Citations are one of the ways that we evaluate researchers, whether it's uh, for an editorial or peer reviewer role for a journal or for career progression. And one of the ways that bad actors were able to find their way into Hindawi journals as guest editors was through this kind of manipulation as um, Hindawi was using measures such as H-index, for example, to evaluate expertise. Next slide, please. So I won't speak for long about the negative consequences because I'm sure this audience is all very much aware and understand how significant they are. But to mention a couple of points, I think that the fact that the scale of the problem is making headlines in, in the, uh, the popular media is, is really concerning, given the potential to erode the public trust in science. And the other point I want to make here is that the, con the consequences of publishing integrity problems can be really and increasingly significant for, for stakeholders. So as a publisher, our experience with Hindawi shows that not only the journals directly affected suffer, but a whole portfolio of journals or a brand can suffer as well. And it's a steep hill to climb to regain reputation. And the challenges are not just the reputational impact, but also the huge cost of investigating and cleaning up. The same can apply to institutions. I saw a piece in Retraction Watch just today about a university in Vietnam having to cancel a course taught by a professor who was found to have manipulated peer review. So I think in short, this really says that it's in all of our interests to work together to address these problems. Next slide, please. So the title of my presentation mentioned the need for a more proactive approach and proactive approaches to preventing publishing integrity problems aren't new. So a good example is that for many years now, most publishers have been incorporating tools for detecting plagiarism in their screening workflows. But now more than ever, we need to be proactive given the scale of the issues that we're facing. So, so what does this really mean in practice? One really important factor here is that unfortunately we, we need to move away from the trust-based approaches that we've somewhat relied on in the past. For example, when it comes to the identity and the expertise of authors, reviewers and editors, our experience with Hindawi clearly highlighted the fact that we need to do more than just check a name against a record in a third party database. We need to be more proactive in checking that people are who they say they are and looking for signals of previous involvement in publishing integrity issues. So across the board, we need to be identifying our vulnerabilities and closing the gaps. We need to be using our systems to identify suspicious activity, and we need to be anticipating what the next threat might be and preparing for that. And importantly, working together to share information and solutions. Next slide, please. So this slide illustrates my last point about thinking about all possible vulnerabilities in the publishing process. And this is an example of how we're thinking about it within Wiley. And you can see that we're looking at every step in the process from identity of authors, reviewers, editors, through the integrity of the peer review process and to the content 
of the papers and the other papers that they're citing. In some areas, we're already really confident in our checks and processes. In others, we have more work to do or we see new threats emerging. And so we've been investing really significantly in the technology that enables us to do this. I, I think I'm pretty safe in saying that it's our number one priority. Um, we're also investing in people, not just technology. Um, we, we still need humans to make sure that we, we're making the right decisions. And so we have an expanded team at Wiley dedicated to investigating and reviewing research integrity issues. Next slide, please. So I've already highlighted the need for collaboration. And um, despite all the effort we're making within Wiley, there's only so much that we or any publisher can do alone. And this applies at all stages from preventing problems in the first place to investigations and outcomes. So for example, in the area of prevention, individual publishers absolutely should be investing in screening and playing our part in educating researchers about their roles as responsible authors, editors, and reviewers. But we can do even more if we partner with other publishers so that we can share information and tools. When it comes to taking action, publishers have the responsibility of investigating and ensuring the right outcome, whether that's exoneration, correction, retraction, or whatever that might be. But we also need to work with other stakeholders to really ensure that we're all learning from the findings. So for example, applying these insights to educating researchers as early as possible in their careers about publishing ethics, um, which is where I think institutions as well as publishers have a really big role. Next slide, please. Um, so this is my final slide, and it's really highlighting some of the key collaborations that Wiley is involved in. So I should say straight off that Wiley is, of course, a member of COPE, which has been foundational in this space. And my colleague, Mike Streeter, who's our Director of Research Integrity and Pub Publishing Ethics, is a member of the COPE Council. Um, Todd has just spoken about the correct recommendations that have re been recently released by NISO. And I'm pleased to say that Wiley was one of the publishers working with NISO on these recommendations. And of course, the next step is to ensure that we're fully compliant. I think we're already a long way towards that goal, at least with the essential recommendations and more to come. Um, in terms of other collaborations, so STM, the industry body for scholarly publishing, has a really strong focus on integrity. This is where we work together as publishers to share experiences, develop policies and guidance for the industry and also to develop tools. Um, and so the Integrity Hub strategy really has two main parts. The first is developing and implementing tools for screening for paper mill hallmarks. And the second part is um, supporting industry-wide solutions for sharing data and sharing expertise about paper mill submissions so that one publisher is not just passing a problematic paper along to another publisher. And SDM have developed two tools which are in different stages of development. They have a paper mill checker tool, which is um, a standalone tool, so it's not integrated into um, electronic um, editorial systems. Um, publishers can upload submitted manuscripts to test for paper mill hallmarks. And um, Wiley colleagues have tested the tool and provided feedback on that. The second tool is the duplicate submission tool, which is in its pilot phase. So this tool can be integrated into any publisher, EEO, Scholar One, Editorial Manager, et cetera, and can identify whether a given submission is under review or has been submitted to another journal that's also in the pilot. Um, so obviously, importantly, the more journals involved in the pilot, the better. That provides a larger data set um, against which we can screen and compare. Another really important initiative is United to Act. This brings together about 40 stakeholders across the research ecosystem. So not just publishers, but librarians, institutions, independent research integrity sleuths, editors, societies, and so on. And the big areas of focus here are number one, awareness, and secondly, prevention. Um, so Wiley's been involved from the start with United to Act. And um, my colleague, Mike Streeter, who I mentioned previously, 
posted a blog just last week on the Wiley Network about the progress that this group is making. So they've now published draft recommendations for the research and scholarly publishing community in a number of key areas and they're actively asking for feedback now. So that window is open. Um, finally, it's really important to mention the work of independent integrity sleuths I referred to earlier. If you're not familiar with that term, these are researchers who, um, on top of their day jobs, put extensive time into identifying and reporting research integrity issues with published papers. And in the context of Hindawi, several of these people were really instrumental in highlighting problems and helping us identify patterns. And we're really grateful to them and are increasingly engaging directly to, to share knowledge and to collaborate. Next slide, please. So um, I hope this has been a useful overview from the perspective of a big publisher. Um, I want to say, I want to end by saying that it's exciting that there is a real will to tackle these problems. That's really building and we're starting to really get somewhere. And forums like this where different stakeholders can come together and share their insights is really crucial. So, so thanks to, to Chorus and to the organizers for including me in the session. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. And thanks to all the speakers. Um, please, if you have any questions, please uh, add them to the Q&A box. Uh, I see we have a few already. Um, the first one is for you, Michael, just uh, about the uh, what is the institutional perspective as as onto why it's difficult to collect accurate metadata? Are there incentives for researchers to participate faithfully? And why don't they? Um, so I, I, I'm, yeah, so I guess the, there, there aren't really incentives and, and so the, they're required to enter their publications, uh, annually in, into this system. It's, um, used for, uh, for promotion. It's used for decisions about merit increases and so on. And, uh, um, if you're a full professor, Professor, and you've got an article in Nature and another article in in another high impact journal. Why are you going to bother listing the three other articles you you published? Right, um, that doesn't matter in in your in your context. Um, it's also once it's entered, why go back and fix it? You already get the credit for it. Um, so I think it's I think it, I think it really comes down to that. Um, and so I think. Um, the work that we've taken on where we go in and we we clean up that metadata has been um it's been appreciated by the faculty who don't want to do this work and it's been appreciated by um the office of institutional research which um wasn't getting accurate um data anyway so so i think it's 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 mostly about there's there's not really a lot of there's not there's not a good reason to do this if you're not um sort of early career um, and sort of trying to get everything possible counted. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, there was another question um, that was sort of uh, pulled back or retracted, um, but still, um, do we have a way of unambiguously flagging an article's retraction? I mean, as being retracted, I know as in my days as a researcher, I would collect uh, bibliographic information as I read papers, don't always check the the record today. So what are the processes in place that could help us identify truly retracted papers uh, at all stages? Well, sure. And in first, uh, I appreciate Lisa's question. Um, there are articles that, and there have been, I mean, a number of publishers do a variety of different things. And we, in the process of developing the NISA recommended recommendations, built on some of the practices that already exist. The challenge was across many different publishers and even across many different journals within publishers, there was inconsistent practice. Some publishers did use retracted as the first word in the title, um, ideally, what we'd like to see is 
if you're writing about retractions, and many researchers do, try not to use retracted is the first word. Um, consistent practice across the community will help. Now, one of the things that we hope is that there develops consistent practice across all publishers, or at least the vast majority of publishers, that system suppliers will be able to develop things and integrate the metadata infrastructure into their tools. So say if you are using a citation management system as a researcher, there could be an integrated API that searches something like Crossref's retraction watch data and then adjusts the, adjusts the citations in your system uh, to say, hey, uh, you know, refresh the information in my system on a daily, weekly, monthly basis so that when I get around to actually using those citations in a paper, they will be noted as retracted and can be flagged and removed. Or possibly, you know, there are people, again, who are writing about retractions where citing retracted work is something that is done, but knowing that it is retracted and signaling it to the community, yes, we're, we're citing this as, as bad practice or as an error and it needed to be fixed. We, don't, we certainly don't want to stop that kind of work. Uh, we don't want to create barriers to that work. We just want to be clear of what's happening and why. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, can, can I jump in here with a little Please. thing? Please, Ed. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, what Todd said about having some technical tools is really helpful. Um, in mathematics, there are things called retractions that are mathematical things. And the author of the paper has no idea about, you know, NISO and their standards. Um, I'm unfortunately frequently confused with a urologist at the University of Michigan with my name. So I've also learned that there are a lot of things in medicine and surgery called retractions. Um, and I'm sure it exists in other subjects. And so trying to get the hundreds of thousands of authors to avoid doing this or the editors of journals to do this um, will be only a partial solution. So with NISO's uh, release of these standards and being able to put things in metadata to allow kind of automated versions of this, then you know we can try to get authors to be better behaved about stuff, but then we can also back up that behavior by uh, programmatic methods, which I think is really going to be the more effective thing to do. Thank you, Ed. And actually, following up on on that a little bit, and and what you're doing with um, uh, mathematical reviews, is anytime I I think about curation or selectivity about uh, inclusion of journals, etc., I I always worry about bias um, and inherently um, making it more restrictive for saying. Uh, 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 lower income type journals or journals from lower income nations getting into the environment. Um, what do you do at mathematical reviews to sort of try to? So we keep track of journals and geographic location and types of institutions that are um, producing them. And um, you know, geographical representation is a factor in the editorial decisions, right? So a weak journal that's coming out of Oxford um, is going to have a hard time. Um, a sort of below average journal that's coming out of, uh, you know, someplace in, um, you know, an underrepresented area of the world, probably Southern Hemisphere, is going to have, you know, some extra points attached to it for that. Um one of the things that I enjoy telling the elite mathematicians that are frequently on our board of trustees or council or whatever is that 90% of mathematicians are not top 10% mathematicians. And that's where the bulk of the work is going on. It always takes a second for a mathematician to absorb that fact, but it's a real fact. And so we want to be able to represent the bulk of, you know, in our minds, the bell curve of 
you know, some imaginary standard that you might want to apply uh, in the database. So, yes, that's a good question. We do try and make sure that we have uh, diversity, both in terms of subject area and geography. Thank you. Um, now, the first three speakers, I mean, you, you talked a lot about, um, you know, metadata controlled um, methodologies to sort of help sort of researchers sift through the literature to help identify which are retracted pieces, which are so therefore, what are the unretracted pieces of the literature. Um, however, we know that when we talk societal uh, interest, right, there, there is a lot more public interest in the, that minority group that is retracted. And that has sort of eroded some of the trust in the scholarly literature. Um, so maybe I'll start with Louisa here. So how does all of this together, since your talk sort of brought all of these issues together on how it's then applied um, practically at a publisher level, but how do we bring all of this together? How do we help um, bring back the trust in the scholarly literature, bring back the trust in science when we see all our institutions, especially in the U.S., receiving pretty major hits? Yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, I think a lot of it comes back to the need to work together and provide a united front on this. So this is why um, initiatives such as United to Act are really important. I think publishers, institutions, funders together can have a much stronger voice in terms of really articulating the huge efforts that are going in to protect and to clean up the scholarly record. Um, so I think it's the responsibility of those stakeholders together to really come together and, and um, come up with a strategy for addressing those issues. Um, I think institutions, publishers, um, you know, have extensive reach and, and we can we can get the message out there between us. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, building on that, I think one of the key elements, one of the core elements of scholarly communications is trust and vetting and the work that we do. And this has been work. This is uh, things highlighted by Jody and her work uh, and others certainly, is the effort to clean it up. If an error is noted, the effort to clean it up, the effort to make sure that it is as correct as it possibly can be, is should be a signal uh, to the wider community that this is a core element of what we're trying to do in scholarly communications. And this, the effort involved is significant and the the fact that large publishers are are committed to this in a variety of ways and you know no one is ever happy about having to withdraw hundreds of papers but doing it is a signal that they take this seriously and no one is perfect every you know any process is going to have issues and challenges it's how you react to those issues and challenges that is a measure of your commitment. My hope is that we will be recognized. Realistically, the challenge is going to become ever more difficult with generative AI tools, with image manipulation tools. All of these tools are getting better, faster, cheaper, more available. How we as a community address them in a systematic way is going to be critical about how we're viewed. And that is that is a key element of what sets scholarly publishing apart from, you know, other forms of media. Very good. Yeah. Um, one thing that I find interesting about uh, this public world of retractions and you know we in the scholarly community are new about what now the public does is that it parallels in some way that the public got to see the scientific method in real time with the covid crisis that um a lot of the public thinks that science happens the way it happens in movies right stephen hawking is staring into a fire and suddenly solves you know the black hole problem 
Um, it's not. It goes in fits and starts, and it goes forwards, then backwards, and corrects itself. And so I think when publishers um, do retractions publicly, it's helping to inform the, the world of the kind of scientific method in real time that goes on uh, you know, all the time for the researchers, but now the public gets to see it. Of course, spinning that the right way is is tough, right? Because you you open yourself up to criticism by the uninitiated, and you know, kind of informing them that this is normal behavior and it's good that you don't bury your mistakes is the tricky part. But as a trained scientist, I think it's great that we're doing this, and I think it's great that we're doing it publicly. So, so Michael, actually, I wanted to ask you this because you, you had mentioned it in your talk too, is a lot of people feel that protection of reputation is one of the barriers to correcting the literature, to going out there and being upfront. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, well, I mean, I, I and I, I hope I didn't imply that I was worried about um, sort of the presence of a retraction as, as sort of damaging our reputation. I was actually saying the opposite, right? That, 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 um, if we're presenting um, false or misleading or any sort of error in, in um, on the University of Denver website, right, that's damaging to reputation, right? So I think I think the it's it's imperative that we ensure that that we are presenting the most accurate information we possibly can um, about our faculty and about their research and um, and sort of linking to the most accurate versions of their research. Um, so so I, I I think that from a reputation perspective, it it really should be the case that we are able to say um, as an institution, we 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 value um, the accuracy of this information. We value um, the process. Uh, we we care about um, the sort of the science more broadly than just about um the right we, we're not worried about the fact that we're we're showing that um people make mistakes right it's it is part of the process so i think i think that um it probably does a service to m more broadly than than just for the university to to be able to say this is this is i, I guess to follow up ed's point right this is this is how it should work Right. Yeah. There should there should be retractions because it shows that we're actually doing doing things correctly. And yeah, I think, yeah, I think it goes sort of to the looking past maybe the short term embarrassment of having to retract a paper and admit a mistake to really the long term reputational goal um, to show that you're really dedicated to ensuring integrity uh, within the process. Now, I see. Um, by my time, we're getting close to, to the end, to the half hour. So uh, I think that's a great place to end. And I want to thank, again, all four speakers for outstanding talks. And uh, I turn it over to you, Howard. Yeah, that was a great session. Uh, thanks to everyone. Uh, we hope you, everyone that has attended has found the session interesting and informative. Obviously, we've all got a long road ahead of us. We will be sharing this video and presentations in a few days. And uh, again, a huge thank you to our sponsors, ACM, IEEE, ACS, AIPP, uh, Geoscience World, Solichair, and STM. And I'm being reminded that I'm not sharing that screen, so I'm gonna share that screen. And enjoy the rest of your week and look forward to uh, our upcoming things in September. Um, we actually don't have anything in August, but look forward to our forums in September. So uh, thank you everyone and uh, have a great day.